So there was a woman who died, went to heaven, and she's nervously walking towards the pearly gates. She sees St. Peter. St. Peter says, hello, Helen, how are you? He says, she says, you know me. He says, yes, your name is right here. She says, I'm going to get in? He says, absolutely, you're a devout Christian. You follow the Lord, you serve faithfully, and you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. You are coming in, but there's one little thing I forgot to mention. What? You have to be able to spell a word. She said, spell a word? What, what, what word? He says, any word. She says, any word? She says, how about joy? He says, how do you spell it? She says, J-O-Y. Ding, 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 the gates opened and she walked in and she was so excited as she walked in and Peter said, hold on a minute. Can you just watch the gate for a moment? I have to just do something, handle some kingdom business and I'll be right back. While she's at the gate, she's smiling and she sees this figure coming towards her and she looks, she goes, Stephen, it was her husband. What are you doing here? He says, sweetheart, on my way home, after I found out that you had died, I was so, such a nervous wreck, I had an accident and I died, and now I'm here in heaven with you. And she says, well, your name is on the list, but, but you have to spell a word. <laughs> and he says, what word? She said, Czechoslovakia. I am one who believes in laughing and fun. If you've hung out with me at all, I am a jokester. My wife would tell you that I play way too much and I say not enough. And, and so there's so much to be thankful for and to be joyous about and so much to bring us laughter. But then there's times or things that are very, very serious and that we need to contemplate and think about for a moment. And I, I need some help here today. I, I'm, I'm not a great preacher. I just, I just think about things. And, and I'm thinking about in Acts in chapter 10, and there were these two figures that were preeminent in that story. It's, it's Cornelius and Peter. And, 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 I, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm concerned, and I'm, and I'm thinking about how these two men were so similar. Think about the similarities of these two men, both served the Lord, both desired to have a good relationship with God, both were leaders of men, both were discipling others towards a relationship with God, both prayed to the same God, both prayed at the same time at the hours of prayer, both cared about the poor, the least, the last, and the left out. They were both in the army, one the Roman army, one the army of the Lord. They had so much in common, and yet they were divided by a wall. Though Peter was in Joppa and, and, and Cornelius was in Caesarea, uh, Caesarea and he was, he was, they were just 30 miles apart, a two-day journey, not far, but yet these walls that divided them made them thousands of miles apart. They were not divided by the God they serve, not divided by the scripture that they read, not divided by the prayers that they prayed, not divided by their mission in life, but they were divided by cultural realities, by laws and rules that made it unclean and undignified for a, a self-respecting Jew to ever hang out with a doggone Gentile. And Peter, knew better. Peter was saved and was given a second and a third chance. Peter was brought to the very presence of the risen Savior and he asked Peter several times, will you feed my sheep? Do you love me? Will you feed my sheep? Do you love me? Will you feed me? Do you love me? He says, yes, yes. He understood that there was a great mandate to go out beginning in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the... He knew what the mandate was. He understood what it meant when the, when the veil was ripped from the top down and that the dividing walls of separation were no longer in existence, but yet he was still a man. 
and he struggled. Yeah. Not with what he experienced when Jesus hung out with those he wasn't supposed to hang out, but his own cultural, social, religious baggage. He did. And what we don't like to see in the Bible is that Jews hate it. To say they didn't get along or disliked each other is an understatement. They hated each other and had no dealings. And so there was a wall that was divided. And I'll tell you, when I first did research on this text some years ago, before I was pastoring, I had an issue. I said, you know, I'm not going to be like Peter because Peter's a trip. <laughs> Peter doesn't take the gospel seriously. There are no walls that divide us. There's no Greek nor Jew, male nor female, slave or free, black or white, purple or green. Laker fans, Clipper fans. Yeah. Whatever, Clipper fans. Nah. So, and so I knew that as a pastor, I wanted to have a commitment to grow. I, I want to grow. I did not want my calling as a pastor to be the end of my growing. I didn't want to preach in front of hundreds of people to be the pinnacle of my success. I wanted to stretch and grow. And so, so now I'm the new pastor of a church in Danbury, Connecticut, the New Hope Baptist Church, and, 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 and I'm there, and, 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 and everybody's pulling at me, right? You're the new kid on the block. We want you to serve on this committee, be a part of this team. And, and I was kind of saying no, because I was always told to kind of take your time, don't jump in too quickly. But then I was approached by a group of people from the AIDS Project of Greater Danbury. The AIDS Project of Greater Danbury was an organization that gave support to uh, people who were suffering with AIDS and one of the challenges that they had with the people who needed support who were suffering from AIDS is that many churches turned their backs on those who had AIDS. They, 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 there were churches that wouldn't even let funerals happen because they thought the bodies were so contaminated that it would, it would, it would, it would infestate the, um, infect the whole sanctuary. People would come in on Sunday and get AIDS because a dead body the day before was in the sanctuary. It was that kind of ignorance, that kind of idiocy that was flowing and that, that they couldn't get pastoral care and chaplaincy care at the hospital because some chaplains would not go see them and they, they couldn't get hospice care and they, and they couldn't get home visits because people were afraid and so me being a new pastor, young, dumb, and I was a super Christian. Any super Christians in the house you thought that you were an invisible? I was able to leap a sinner in a single bound. I was mighty pitch the pastor. Come on, somebody. Anyone else? Super Christian. I'm not going to be like Peter because I know that those, 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 them people need me. Them people need me. And so I go and I serve them people. And when I got to serving them people, I realized something that was very, very powerful. That them people... Reminded me of me. That those people who I thought were them people was really my people. And what God did not need from Ivan was another sermon. What God needed from Ivan was to be open to be used to begin to tear down the walls that divide us. Yes, and God began to do an incredible work. I'm going to pause there and go back to my dear friend Peter. I didn't judge him so much now because I can relate to what it feels like when you have to go and deal with them people.
if the truth be told, some of us struggle in our own walk with Christ, with dealing with some of them people. I discovered that them people, and as Peter discovered with some of them people, that we pray to the same God. We have the same desires for our family. We have the same goal is to grow and to develop and to be more like Christ. And so God did something that only God can do. Let me show you what God did. And it's interesting because Cornelius and Peter both not only prayed, but they both got revelations from God and both had visions from God. That God spoke to both of them directly. Even though one was a dreaded, horrible Gentile. Can you imagine God speaking to Gentiles? Or those who are suffering with AIDS? And not because they got AIDS from a blood transfusion or even drugs, but they got it the good old-fashioned way. How could God speak to such a people like that? And then God did some things, and I'll share with you. And then uh, you all have to be prepared because at the end of my little Easter speech here, um, (laughs) I'm going to ask you some questions, and I expect to get a little bit of feedback because what I don't want to do is give you a little cute three points, and you go home and say, that was cute. I want you to think about how you're going to change your perceptions, your behavior, your attitudes, so that the walls that we have built up that God didn't put in place, we begin to tear them down. Because I'll make a very radical and bold statement. I think the problem, and if you were in my session yesterday, the problem with this country is not the government, it's not the division of races, or cultures, or those who are vaccinated or not vaccinated, those who are legal or illegal. I think the biggest challenge in this country, and the only way that this country will be one nation truly under God is when the church decides that there are no walls of separation. So God begins to orchestrate something that only God can do. God gives Peter a vision. He tells Peter in this vision, he says, Peter, he says, I'm going to show you all this food. And he's he's, he's, he's in a trance, and he shows him all this food. And he says, now I want you to eat this. He says, I will never eat these unclean. He says, nothing is unclean that has deemed to be clean. And then he tells Peter that he wants him to go to uh, Cornelius' house. And then he's getting ready to go into Cornelius' house, and he says to Cornelius, "Uh, you know I don't pull to come up in here, man. We don't mess around with y'all like that. And he comes in, and there's an incredible movement of God's spirit in that place. And they begin to speak in tongues and begin to show evidence of the power of God moving even in the Gentiles. And he realized that he had more in common than he thought. And then he comes back in in, in Acts chapter 11. He goes back to his people, and they begin to say, hey, we heard you was hanging out with them folks. What's up with that? And he began to speak to them in a way that satisfied them. That's the story. Let me give you three things that we must do in our society today to begin to tear down the walls of division. The first thing we must do is make it personal. Make it personal. Peter came to his home and came inside of his house. Make it personal. I, I, I began to... Um, Interact with the folks that were in the hospital, those who had AIDS in the hospital. And I began to visit them in their homes when they were released. And I began to make it personal, to hear their stories and saw how I was more like them than I cared to admit. When them becomes us, the walls begin to come down. Let me share something very powerful. Um, I only have a few more minutes and I'll try to go quickly. My mother grew up in the Jim Crow South. How many people know what Jim Crow South is? How many people don't know what it is? Ask the people who sat next to you. Okay, look. <laughs> the Jim Crow South is the South that was divided by black and white um, um, colored water fountains, colored restrooms, white, so forth, and segregated. And her father had to move in the middle of the night because he was registering people to vote. In the, uh, and, and the family, she remembers as a little girl, they had to leave in the middle of the night and move because her father was going to be lynched by a group of people who were upset because he was housing freedom riders and registering people to vote. And so she grew up with, I didn't even know this, my mother's one of the most docile, one of the most loving people you ever meet. She grew up with this incredible hate for white people. 
And so my mother began to send us at an early age to schools that were integrated schools where, they were, where we were the minority and, and, and the other folks were the majority. And we began to learn how to interact with uh, white folks and began to interact with Jews and began to interact with different cultures and different races and different backgrounds. And some years later, my mother told me, uh, do you know why I sent you up there? You know why I sent you to those schools? She said, I said, why, Mom, why, why did you send us there? She said, because I had a personal hate for white folks that I didn't want to pass on to my children. I had to teach you how not to carry on the hate that I had. Number two, not only make it personal, but we need to mark our perspective, check ourselves, understand what stereotypes, what, what do we believe about people that we've never spent any time with. Here's a, here's a, here's a rule of thumb. Anything that comes from anyone's mouth that denigrates the humanity of any other person, regardless of their voting status, their citizenship, whether they're vaxxed or not vaxxed, rich or poor, black, white, purple or blue, you are to rebuff it, rebuke it, and deny that from coming into your heart because what you listen to, faith cometh by hearing, and you begin to hear that stuff, you begin to take on what you don't challenge. Certain people are lazy. Certain people came here illegally or whatever it may be. Anything that denigrates the human dignity of anyone must be challenged. We must challenge every stereotype. Amen? Amen. Let me give you this last one. Make it personal. We must mark our perspectives. Why do we think? It's funny because because marking our perspectives means you have to ask the question, what are we holding on to that's destroying the body of Christ from being unified? There's a good friend of mine who went to, um, I think he went to India. And while he was in India uh, doing some missionary work, he had an opportunity to go to a restaurant and, and he didn't, uh, couldn't read the menu and his interpreter was interpreting what the menu was on me. He said, you should try this. This is an, an Indian delicacy. He says, okay, what is it? He said, it is, it is brain. It's monkey brain. He said, monkey brain. He said, do you have chicken? I mean, it was, <laughs> I don't he says, he said, you can order chicken. He said, but let me tell you how we get the, how we get the monkey brains and how we, how we get the food. He said, he said, what we do is we have a jar with a string on it in the jungle, in the forest, he says, and we put an apple in it. And he says, and the monkey comes out and he grabs the apple. And when he grabs the apple, the, uh, the hunter pulls the string up and he's hanging by the apple because he won't let go. And while he's holding on to it, someone comes behind him and pops him in the head. And that's how we get the monkey brain as a delicacy. And the question is, what are we holding on to that is killing our witness, that's destroying our ability to give life and to have life? Last point, last point, last point. And we must endure pain. For the glory of God, pain is a part of the process. When you take a stand against the cultural realities of our lives, the laws, the rules, the the standards by which we have put up walls, then you will be attacked. People will talk about you. People will ostracize you. People will question your Christianity. How can you hang with this person when they voted this way? When we put our Christianity based on who we vote or whether we've been vaccinated or not or where we live, come on somebody, or what we believe about baptism or whatever it may be, the women in the ministry, that are, are, those are artificial walls that we have put up that God did not put up. <laughs> so I'm working with these, with these people, with them. I'm working with them thems. And as I'm working with them dams, um, I, uh, I begin to get some feedback from the community. And one of my most trusted um, trustees came to me and said, why are you working with them people? We don't like that. People are saying in the community that you must be really gay and you're just trying to work out your guilt by serving those people. Other pastors, believe it or not, began to not interact and fellowship with us because of the work that I was doing. 
And it was hard, it was painful because I had this issue, I have this psychological condition where I need to be liked. I had to make a decision. Will I follow what I know God wants? Or will I do what is pleasing to man and women? Can I handle the pain of social rejection to deliver the message of Jesus Christ? to a world who needs it most. And here's what I want you to see. And I'm almost finished. Y'all know Baptists say that three times before they hear <laughs> And so now, I'm struggling, because I don't know. And my wife, who was here today, she would tell you that I struggled. I was like, I hate being looked at like that. I hate for people to judge me based, they don't even know me. I'm new, I'm just trying to do good stuff. And now I'm labeled because of the company I keep, the people I want to serve. And so I had to do a funeral. A young man, 23 years old, his name was Seth. Seth was a Jew. And so as I'm in the mortuary preaching his eulogy, there's a woman. Now, there's only hospital workers and social workers and other people in his community that were there. And he was a gay man. And there was a woman to the far right in the corner the whole time, looked like she was dressed to go to the beach and she's crying the whole service. And at the end of the service, she comes to me and she says this to me. She says, thank you for introducing me to a Jesus that loves unconditionally. She says, Seth was my son. And when he came out the closet, when he was 17 years old, my husband forbade me from interacting with him again. He has two younger sisters, and one is playing soccer. I dropped her off at the soccer meet, and I snuck here. No one knows that I'm here to see my son be funeralized. She says, because of his lifestyle, we rejected him. But the Jesus you talked about loved him in spite of. She says, I want to know the Jesus that would love someone that his own family wouldn't love. I thought, Willie, I thought our job was to go to the ends of the earth, spreading the good news that Christ died. He endured the pain. He took on our sin. By his stripes, we were healed. He went through hell. On the third day, he got up with all power in his hand. He endured the pain for our glory and our, for his, God's glory and our benefit. Will you endure the pain for God's glory and for the benefit of someone who doesn't know God as an ultimate lover. God is the ultimate salvation. God is the ultimate Lord of our life. That's the question. Now I am two or three minutes over. I wanna spend 30 seconds taking two comments. What struck you? Someone tell me, what struck you? What stood out? You gotta make it personal, you gotta spend some time. You gotta mark our perspectives and we must endure pain. Y'all gonna have me stand up here looking like an idiot. All right, so we're going to go there and then there, real quick. Yeah. And you don't have to make a choice. I think one of the people, one of the things that we believe is that we have to make a choice to either love the person and accept their sin. You can not accept someone's lifestyle and still love them. As a matter of fact, that's what we're called to do. The woman with the issue, the woman is caught in a very active adultery. He didn't accept her lifestyle. He loved her and said, go. But he loved her first. Then he commanded her not to sin. Yes, sir.
Here's my final comment. Is that it was not anything I did because I didn't even know that was his mother. All we do is preach the gospel. And God gives the increase. It ain't your work. It's not your ability. It's not your thoughts. It's not your words. It is the work of God that only God can remove the walls that divide us. We are just instruments as we tear down. Same God. It was cultural realities that separated us. Are we going to continue to allow the hatred of our past to pass on to the generations that are coming that we still can't walk together in Christian love? I pray that we all have a Peter moment where we are transformed and allow God to use us in a mighty way.